quienes somos los Latinos. We are 16 million Hispanic inhabitants, 32 million voters in the 2020 presidential election. We live in California, Texas, Florida, and New York. Uh, we are one out of six people in the United States. Our population grows more than a million a year per year. We are a new American reality. We live between two cultures, but it's like a thumb, bachata, salsa, merengue, and American music we love to enjoy from quesadillas to hamburgers. Somos los Latinos. We live in two worlds because we speak Spanish and English. We enjoy the World Cup as well as the Super Bowl and we love football. We live the American dream. We also want to be doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, have our own houses and make a home. We make our culture even more interesting. We love this country. We love our community. We are Hispanic Americans. We are Latino and we are Hispanic. Above all, we are human beings with a big heart, a contagious joy with a tireless passion. What Hispanic heritage means to me is the sacrifices that both my parents did to bring me and my family to the U.S. to have a better life. Being Hispanic to me is having the opportunity to speak two languages and having the privilege to celebrate everything with delicious food while enjoying our culture and heritage. As an Hispanic, it's all about embracing the culture and embracing the richness of being proud as an Hispanic. Hispanic Heritage Month is the moment when all members of the Latino community connect with their heritage, also showcasing their beauty of being proud Latinos. Hola, me llamo Annalise y el ser hispana para mí significa tener el privilegio de hablar más de un idioma, tener la oportunidad de ser bilingüe, de disfrutar el sabor de diferentes comidas, música, deporte y mucho más. Ser latina, ser hispana es un orgullo para mí. Buenas tardes. Thank you for viewing our Hispanic Heritage event. My name is Athena Paja and I am representing the AP Spanish class of Mrs. Williams. My presentation is about fun facts about the Hispanic culture. Fun fact number one, there are many states throughout the United States such as Montana, Colorado, and Nevada whose names came from Spanish words. As you can see in this picture signified by the yellow, these are states whose names originated from Spanish words, like Florida, all the way down here. Here's a video on the origin of how Florida's name came to be. So let's begin with some states. First one here, Florida. Now in the year of 1513, there was a Spanish explorer named Juan Ponce de Leon who landed his ship near the shores of St. Augustine, Florida. He was looking, he was actually looking for the Fountain of Youth, um, but unfortunately he never found it. But because he landed in the area around the time of Easter, and one of the names in Spanish for Easter is Pascua Florida, he named it Florida or Florida. By the way, Florida means flowering. So that is how Florida got its name. Fun fact number two. Lunch is usually the main meal of the day, which is sometimes followed by a short nap. Fun fact number three, the value of honor and family is very high throughout Hispanic culture, along with dignity and pride. In this picture, these are other values that people in the Hispanic culture hold extremely close to them, like heritage and traditions and religion or spirituality. Fun fact number four, the projected Hispanic population in the United States will be 132.8 million by 2050. Fun fact number five, the 15th of September marks Hispanic Heritage Month in the United States. The 15th of September is when five Latin countries gained their independence. Those countries being Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Fun fact number six, there are eight states in the United States that have a population of one million or more Hispanic people. These states are Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, and Texas. As you can see in this picture, signified by the blue, these are states who have the most Hispanic population. And signified by the red, these are states who have the least Hispanic population. So states along here 
and here and here have the most Hispanic population throughout the United States. Fun fact number seven. There are over 489 million native Spanish speakers in the world, making Spanish the second most spoken native language in the world. Fun fact number eight. Many American traditions came from Hispanic culture, like barbecuing. The word barbecue comes from the Spanish word barbacoa. As you can see, I have a picture on the side here of barbacoa. Fun fact number nine. Hispanic people have fought in almost all of the wars throughout American history. Their contribution in wars goes as far back as the Revolutionary War. There are more than 1.2 million Hispanic or Latino veterans in the United States. Fun fact number 10. In Hispanic culture, Christmas is a religious holiday that is very important. They have objects called nativity scenes or nacimientos that make this tradition very unique. Thank you and I hope you all are well and have a great day. Good afternoon, administrators, teacher in classmates. My name is Lisbeth Hernandez, and it gives me great pleasure to represent my AP Spanish class from Miss William, honoring the Spanish Heritage Month. Today, I'm going to share my presentation about some of the symbols that represent our Spanish culture in different countries. Let's begin with El Sombrero de México. Symbols que representan a México. La comida, la cultura, bailes, tequila, sombreros, música, mariachis, día de muertos, vestimenta, entre otras muchas cosas. Tiene una variedad de tradiciones y costumbres que lo consideran únicas. El sombrero charro es la respuesta a un proceso de apropiación e incorporación simbólica. Una prenda que ha acompañado al mítico personaje del charro mexicano. El sombrero charro fue parte del estereotipo del nacionalismo mexicano del siglo XX. En la cultura de México, como en casi todas las culturas, el sombrero se expresa por sí mismo. Parte de la cabeza hacia los gestos y después hacia las acciones. El sombrero realza ese saber. El sombrero de charro es un sombrero popular de la cultura mexicana, usado principalmente por los jinetes conocidos como charros. Por eso el verdadero sombrero de charro es de la ala ancha, levantado de la parte posterior. Lleva en la copa cuatro pedreadas, que le dan resistencia en caso de impacto. Para ese último caso es mejor el sombrero hecho de palma, que es más sólido y sin ser demasiado pesado. Colombia Símbolos que representan a Colombia, himno, bandera, escudo de Colombia, flor nacional, árbol nacional, ave nacional, sombrero volteado, la chiva. La chiva, más que un medio de transporte autónomo, la chiva o bus escalera es un símbolo de la colombianidad. Conoce estos coloridos buses que transitan las carreteras de Colombia. La chiva lleva muchos años construyendo al desarrollo del país y llevando a los habitantes de todos los rincones de Colombia a su destino. La chiva es un transporte propio de las zonas rurales de los países. La chiva es un transporte propio de las zonas rurales del país, aunque en los últimos años también se ha convertido en sinónimo de recreación, turismo y esparcimiento en las grandes ciudades y un atractivo del turismo en Colombia. República Dominicana Símbolos que representan a la República Dominicana Playas, preferencias culinarias, música, rituales religiosos, bailes, celebraciones emblemáticas, carnaval y comida. El carnaval es el festival más importante intercedente de la cultura popular dominicana y en la República Dominicana. El carnaval es una celebración recreativa de libertad, integración e identidad. Las máscaras, la exageración, el sarcasmo, lo insólito, lo sáptico, lo inédito, lo atrevido, lo grotesco y lo imaginario son partes fundamentales del carnaval. El diablo cojuelo representa un demonio travieso y juguetón que golpea y asusta a las personas. Son bimbas, son los personajes centrales del carnaval dominicano y por ser los más famosos. Abanico de España, símbolos que representan a España, fútbol, toro, abanico, 
León Español, Molinos, El Oso y Madroño, Bailes, Castillos y Iglesias, Corridas de Toros y la Música. El abanico era considerado como un símbolo de alta posición social y sobre todo de las personas con un gran poder. Su empleo estaba restringido para casi todos, excepto el faraón, y estaba permitido también a sus esposas, hijos y familia más directa, solo en ocasiones especiales. Su finalidad no solo era del aire, sino que se utilizaba sobre todo para espantar a los insectos, proteger del sol o atizar a las brasas del hogar. El Quetzal, pájaro de las plumas verde, símbolos que representan a Guatemala, el Quetzal, la ceiba, la monja blanca, la marimba, Tecumán, pirámides. El Quetzal es el símbolo de la libertad, de independencia, de autonomía de la nación, fundamentalmente el pájaro simboliza la espiritualidad, el alma, los estados superiores del ser que prisionera del cuerpo vuela de este mundo después de la muerte. Feliz mes de la herencia hispana. Muchas gracias por su atención. Mi nombre es James Hernández y estaré leyendo el poema Aquí Siempre por Jessica Salgado. I carry my culture everywhere I go. It is a trumpet announcing my arrival. A bolero decas my father's accent. A bachata murmur into an ear. An accordion trampoline like a lover's hand. I am made of city lights and volcanoes. My family is a swarm of fireflies illuminating my way home. And home is wherever my people are. Mi gente can multiply hearts. Mi gente can turn a memory into a country. Mi gente can make music out of any heartache. Mi gente can blend two skies into one. Mi gente divorce any story offered as a gift. We stir charm into our coffee. We laugh loud in every language we know. We understand that amor is tender. And corazón is fierce. Our victory is our felicidad. A merengue we keep on repeat. And when we say siempre, it is a promise that a key is anywhere we choose to go home. Hello. Hello, guys. How you doing? Oh, my name is Cesar Familia. I'm doing an AP Spanish, which I got a theme one, which is about dances, but the 10 most popular dances in Latin America. As you can see here, these are the 10 most popular dances that I have chosen because there's a lot of popular dances around the world about Latin America. First, we got bachata, which is made in Republic Dominica, Dominican Republic. Then we got merengue, which is made in Dominican Republic too. Then we got salsa, which it was made in Puerto Rico. Then we got the bow, which is made from Dominican Republic too. We got Congo, which is from Cuba. Then we got Cha Cha Cha, which is Cuban too. We got Dan Dancer of Paraguay, which is from Paraguay. We got Tango, which is from Cuba too. Then we got Cumbia, which is from Colombia. We got Samuaca, which is from Peru. Thank you guys for watching this video and have a good one.
I'm Marlon Duran and this is a simple step to dance bachata. First you want to do is go to the left two times and then go to the right two times. And make sure you want to move your shoulders and your hips. So one, two, one, two. And this is what it's going to look like with the music on. is merengue. The way you want to do this is you want to move your hips and your knees. Bend your knees and move your hips for merengue. And this is how it is with the song. But more, but more hips and knees. And move your legs back in front. Okay. And this is the other step to dance salsa. Salsa, you can do it any way you want, but the most classic way to do it is one leg behind the other and one leg behind the other one. So what you want to do is, salsa is a really fast dance. So when you do it, you want to move fast, back and forth with your leg. This one goes back and then front, and then that one goes back and front. So this is how it sounds with the music. My name is Fatma Namaz. I'm a junior in Harry S. Truman High School. For the Heritage Hispanic Month, the person I chose is Rita Monring. She's an Hispanic American person who has impacted a lot of lives by, by entertaining them. She's a really good mo role model for a lot of people because the work she has done, it has, has a huge impact on them. The Hispanic Heritage Month has influenced on lots of people. One of the Hispanic person who has affected lots of people's life is Rita Monrad. Rita Monrad was born on December 11, 1931 in Puerto Rico. She's 89 years old, living her best life. She considers herself and Puerto Rican and American. Rita has influenced the entertainment industry for over 17 years as an actress, singer, and a dancer. Rita's achievements. At the age of 17, she joined the film industry. She has made over 14 films. Rita's career in music, film, and dance reaches her from Academy Award winning performance as Anita in 1962 motion picture West Side Story. She's, she's one of the few female performers to win all four into the in, entertainment industry's most respected awards the Oscar, the Emmy, and the Grammy. Fun facts She made her Broadway debut in 1949. In November 1949, in Sky Drift, op opposite Ali Wunsch, when she was only 13 years old. She's also the first Hispanic woman to receive an Oscar, given the name Rosita when she was young. Mona's birth name was Rosa Dolores Alro. Question I would like to ask her Who is your inspiration? What do you consider to be your career's highlight? How did you handle your first failure? How was your experience working in the west side of the story? Conclusion After doing all the research about Rita's Mo Rita Monrin, I learned that if you have big dreams, don't be afraid and start chasing them at a young age. She was rejected from Hollywood for being Hispanic, but she said that rejection doesn't mean you don't have what it takes. And I think this is an important message because she made, to, she, made to, she made sure to tell people that she can do anything and anything is possible. Hello everyone, I am Naomi Mepuri, an 11th grader at Harry S. Truman High School, and I'm sharing with you the life of Dolores Horata in celebrating of Hispanic Heritage Month. 
Dolores Herta was born on April 10, 1930. She is alive and well at 91 years old today. Her birthplace is in Donson, New Mexico. Dolores' nationality is Mexican-American. Her occupations were labor leader, activist, and an actress. Dolores Herta is important because she helped organize the Delero Grape Strike in 1965 in California, and she was the lead negotiator in the workers' contract that was created after the strike. Dolores' major achievements are 1. Puffin Slash Nation Prize for Creative Citizenship, 2. Presidential Medal of Freedom, 3. Glamour Lifetime Achievement Award. Interesting facts about Dolores Herta. One, Dolores was inspired by her mother, an intelligent, kind businesswoman. She wanted to be like her because her mother advocated for farm workers and provide free housing to the low income family. Two, Dolores helped recognize the Stockton chapter of the Community Service Organization. She worked hard in this role, helping to improve economic conditions for Latinos. Three, Dolores has received many awards and recognitions, and about four schools are named after her. Dolores quote, we must use our lives to make the world a better place to live, not just acquire things. That is what we are put on the earth for. If I meet Dolores Horta, I would ask her, what motivates you to persevere through your challenges? In conclusion, I have learned that Dolores Herta is a hard-working woman who advocated for immigrants and others in need. Her kindness and perseverance has inspired me to pass on this trend. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you guys enjoy my presentation. Have a good afternoon. The Mirabai sisters were three sisters commonly known as the Prat Patria Mineva Maria Teresa. They opposed the Rafael Trujillo's dictatorship in Dominican Republic. They were involved in underground activities against his power. Patria Mercedes Mirabai Reyes was born on February 27, 1924, Berli Berhica. Bejica Adela Mirabai Reyes was born on March 1, 1925. Maria Argentina Mineva was born on March 12, 1926. What was the Trujillo's dictatorship? Trujillo took over the country's economy from 1930 until 1961. He took over production of such goods as salt, meat, tobacco, and rice and kept the profits to his own family and supporters. Civil and political liberties disappeared, and only one political party, the Dominican Party, was allowed to exist. Trujillo's fearsome secret police, pol police rooted out dissenters using tactics of intimidation, imprisonment, torture, kidnapping, rape of women, and murder. His dictatorship would be responsible for tens of thousands of deaths including the deaths of estimate 20,000 Haitians living near the border between Haiti and Dominican Republic in 1937. The Mirabai sisters traveled on November 25, 1960 to visit their husbands in prison in Puerto Plata. On the way back, Trujillo's henchmen stopped their car along a mountain road and killed their driver, Rufino de la Cruz before kidnapping the sisters at gunpoint, beating and strangling them. A little after their death, the Mirabai sisters became an, a living symbol of something bigger than resistance. They became a symbol of freedom and justice for their people, commonly known as Las Miraposas, the butterflies in their country. Their legacy can be seen everywhere in Dominican Republic. Hello everybody. How everybody's doing? How everybody's feeling? My name is Jameer Scott and for the Hispanic Heritage Month Project, my country was Peru. The capital of Peru is Lima. 
fun fact, I was able to experience and have a fun time at Peru for three hours because of an American cruise line. This American cruise line is owned by Carnival Cooperation and it's located in Seattle, Washington. I definitely recommend checking them out. They take you they take you to amazing places. They have many adventures, many locations you can go to. Definitely recommend checking them out on hollandamerica.com. Trust me, you won't regret it. It's an amazing experience. Peru is a country in South America. On the top left is a map showing the location of Peru in South America and all the things that surround Peru. It's also home to accession of Amazon rainforest and Machu Picchu. On the bottom left is Machu Picchu and how it looks. It looks clear and beautiful. And on the bottom right is a section of the Amazon rainforest where Peruvian people live. They actually make little huts, homes kind of like little huts um, and actually live there. Some people actually live there. On Peru's arid of the Pacific coast is Lima, the capital with a preserved colonial center. They have important collections of pre-Columbian art. On the top right is one of the pre-Columbian arts that Peru have in their collection of pre-Columbian art. And it's a pre-Columbian mask that were made back then. And they have many more art. and But this is one of them. It's a... It's one of the many pre-Columbian masks uh, that pre-Columbian people made. The viche, a seafood dish, is probably Peru's most famous food. When people think of Peruvian food, they automatically think of this food. It consists of raw fish marinated in lime juice, chilies, and onions. This dish is a dish that people say you must try, lomo satado. It's a beef stir fried rice. And if you're into hot stuff, add some Peruvian green sauce on top. A known food in the southern part of Peru is rocoto relleno. This is a stuffed spicy peppers. And since the sweet peppers weren't used in Spain, they were not available in Peru. So they had to go substitute rocoto peppers in and cook it in water and vinegar to remove some spiciness. On the top left is the ceviche, the seafood dish that was that had raw, raw fish marinated in lime juice, chilies, and onions. On the bottom left is the lomo satado. It's the beef stir fry rice. And on the right is the rocoto rellino. It's the stuffed spicy peppers. And all three of these foods were popular and known in Peru. But the most famous is definitely the ceviche. Here's some places to visit. A good place to visit if you like taking pictures and taking selfies is Sierra in Peru. It's a cool place to sit on the hill and take multiple shots of pictures of the view of the mountains in the background and the houses that are below the hill. On the right, that is Sierra in Peru. Machu Picchu, the view is amazing. And also, if, if you're a photogenic person, this is the place for you. The background is clear and the experience of peace up there is amazing. Also, if you like to meditate, love yourself, and some alone time, it's peace and quiet with no distractions. It's an amazing thing about Machu Picchu. On the bottom left, that is Machu Picchu. The last photogenic place to visit is Coca Canyon. It's, it's at Cheve, Peru. And this canyon is one of the world's deepest well-known attractions. And people say if you go to the top, it's the best area to go because... You get an amazing view of the atmosphere. You can get a view of the little houses that are down there. And you can get some amazing shots up there. So people say definitely go to the top of the mountain. And this was Jameer Scott. And this was my project for Hispanic Heritage Month. And my place that I definitely want to visit is Machu Picchu. Because it's amazing up there. And I hope you liked the project. I hope you enjoyed it. And let me know your most anticipated place out of all three of these. I'm actually curious. I'm actually curious to know your most anticipated place. And that's all. Good evening, Truman High School. My name is Daniel Moore. In a Spanish-speaking country, I will be talking about is Costa Rica. Costa Rica is located in South America and split into several regions. San Jose is the capital of Costa Rica. 
All regions have a myriad of rainforests and wildlife, as well as having unique climate zones in each region. This country came to be by a string of underwater volcanoes, grown in height and breadth. They eventually broke the sea surface and continued to expand. To the right, on the top, you can see the flag of Costa Rica, and to the bottom, you can see a rainforest that is in Costa Rica. The regions of Costa Rica are San Jose, Guanacaste, Limon, Erevia, Cartago, Punta Arenas, and Alajuela. The population of Costa Rica currently is 5 million 143,143 people. The natives of Costa Rica are called T the regions of the population of Costa Rica currently is 5,143,143 people. The natives of Costa Rica are called Ticos. In 2020, the yearly population growth rate is 0.96% and it has one of the smallest migration rates in the world. Some music that is popular in Costa Rica are salsa. This genre of music carries Cuban and Puerto Rican influences, having fast and energetic beats. Cumbia originates from Colombia's northern coastline and carries strong influences from the black population. Reggae. Jamaicans travel to Costa Rica and spread the music. And last but not least, Latin Caribbean music played across the country and is imported from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. Foods that they eat in Costa Rica are el casado and tamales. El casado is made of rice and beans, slice of fried sweet plantains, coleslaw, and omelet and vegetables. It is usually accompanied by meat or vegetables and tamales, which is a traditional Christmas dish in Costa Rica and includes rice, beans, and potatoes served on a banana leaf. Here are the popular sports in Costa Rica. Football, surfing, bullfighting, volleyball, sport fishing, and golf. These traditions are celebrated because most Ticos are Catholic. And these traditions relate to Christmas as well. The first tradition they celebrate is Posadas. A little girl and boy dress up as Mary and Joseph, walk around the neighborhood knocking on doors, asking for lodging. Their parents are behind them reading Bible quotes. And after this, the neighborhood then has a religious debate for nine days from December 16th to the 24th. The first Costa Rican I'll be talking about who is famous in America is Franklin Chang Diaz. He is a Costa Rican American physicist, mechanical engineer, and former NASA astronaut. He is the CEO of the Ad Astra rocket company, which he created. He was inducted into the NASA Astronaut Hall of Fame on May 5, 2012. The second person who I'll be talking about who is Costa Rican and famous in America is Harry Shum Jr. He is an actor, singer, choreographer, and dancer. He's best known for his work in films like Step Up to the Streets, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny, and Crazy Rich Asians. His award-winning portrayal of a bisexual person named Magnus Bain and Shadowhunters gained him a large fan following in the LGBT community. Here is a quote from Franklin. My vision is a future for humanity where we will be completely free to pursue activities outside of our planet. The first famous place in Costa Rica I'll be talking about is the Monte Verde Cloud Forest. It has a hundred mammals, lots of clouds and many orchid species. You also get to view the volcano there as well, which is still active today. You can go hiking, horseback riding, and there are other tours as well. The second famous place I'll be talking about is Teatro Nacional. 
and in English, it's called the National Theater. It is an architectural and historical centerpiece of the nation's capital of San Jose. It is more than a century old, and Costa Ricans have a sense of pride from it because of its beauty. The last famous place I'll be talking about is Arino Volcano. People go here to view the volcano that is still active today. You can visit the hot springs, go water rafting, repelling, and there are hiking opportunities. Today we will be learning about Bolivia. On August 17th, 1825, 11 days after the independence from Spain was proclaimed, Bolivia adopted its first national flag. The colors also have been associated with the valor of the army, red, the richness of mineral resources, which is yellow, and the fertility of the land, green. La Paz Sucre, the capital of Bolivia. Bolivia is a country in Central America with a varied terrain, the Atacama Desert, and the Amazon Basin rainforest. Its capital, La Paz, sits on the Andes with snow mountains in the background nearby is a glass smooth lake, Titicaca, known for its crazy views and Instagram pictures, which also, which also the content largest lake. Bolivia is located in a landlocked country in South America bordered by Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Chile, and Peru. Fun fact, La Paz is the highest sea level city in the world. Their popular dance is called Caparalas. It started in the capital city of Bolivia. It was made back in 1969 and is also danced by many different countries in South America. Bolivian music. Moranada is one of the many musics from Bolivia. It's mostly made by instruments that are very similar to the guitar and flute, which are called a tarca and a charangon. A famous place to visit in Bolivia is Madidi National Park. Madidi National Park stretches from Andes towards the Amazons. According to the article, Madidi National Park encompasses over 7,000 square miles. There are many species who make the Madidi National Park. Their habitat, according to New Zealand, more than 11% of the planet's 9,000 species of birds can be found in the Madidi National Park. Famous fruits from Bolivia are kunape is a type of bread filled with cheese, antechuos is a meat kebab, and chola sandwich is a sandwich made by cholas, which is what native women are affectionately called in Bolivia. Hola, mi nombre es Joana Cruz, y hoy voy a hablar de la República Dominicana. Hello, my name is Joana Cruz, and today I will be talking about the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is located on the island of Hispaniola between the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean and is bordered by Haiti to the west. It's made up of 34 cities with the capital city being Santo Domingo. My family lives close to a city called Santiago in an area named Jaque Abajo. There are two very popular types of music in Dominican Republic called merengue and bachata. Merengue is music based on a five-beat rhythmic pattern called a cuantilo and has a two out of four time signature, while bachata has a four out of four time signature. Merengue is sometimes referred to as Dominican Republic's national music. And in the background of both merengue and bachata music, sometimes an instrument called a guira, which is shown at, in the left bottom hand corner of the screen, is used in the background. Dominican Republic has many traditional foods as well. Pastelón is kind of like a lasagna, but instead of the pasta, it has sweet plantains. Mango con salami is salami and mashed plantains, and is usually served with huevos fritos, fried eggs, and queso frito, fried cheese, and it is usually called Dominican Republic's national breakfast. Sancocho is a famous dish in the yard that is made a lot of the time for family get-togethers. It's made of various types of meat and various other ingredients, such as yuca, potatoes, corn on the cob, latinos, and many other things. Additionally, some of my favorite types of foods from the Dominican Republic are the desserts. Tres leches cake is cake with milk absorbed into it. Abichuelas con dulce is a dessert made around the Easter holiday, 
and is basically beans with sugar in it. And lastly, flan is a type of milk pudding. As we draw to a close, I'd like to mention some interesting places you could visit in DR. Ranchos are typically small restaurants near the river where you could sit down and eat Dominican food. At the ranchos, you could also do other activities such as swimming in the river, boat rides, and jet ski rentals. Dominican Republic also has great resorts, some of the most famous located in Puerto Plato, where they have great pools and beaches as well as delicious food. Lastly, the last time I went to DR, I visited a place called the 27 Waterfalls, where you climb up a mountain and get to jump off at different points into the water. Where you jump usually ranges from 1 to 2 feet to 25 feet high. And if you do not want to jump, they also have stairs and slides for you to go down. Hola, me llamo Alyssa Saunders. Voy a compartir información de Cuba. The capital of Cuba is Havana. It has a population of 2 million, making it the largest city in Cuba. In Cuba and many other Hispanic countries, food is what brings the people together and truly adds to the culture. Here are three types of foods that resonate in the hearts of Cubanos. Ropa vieja, translated to old clothes, is the national dish of Cuba. The dish consists of boiled and shredded beef cooked in a bean-based sauce with onion, bell peppers, cumin, and other ingredients. Arroz con huevo frito which is translated to rice and fried egg, is Cuba's version of a struggle meal. Since poverty is very frequent in Cuba, they sometimes can't afford grand meals. Arroz con leche, which translates to rice put in dessert with milk, is a very famous dessert back in Cuba. Places to go in Cuba. Even though Cuba isn't known to be the most welcoming when it comes to tourists, if you ever get a chance to visit, here are some places you must see. If you love to capture the moment and are a bit of a photographer, Festolandia is the place for you. Its quirky aura is the perfect picturesque environment. If you're a lover of ballet and the arts, Grand Theatre of Havana is a great place to see and was designed by the Belgian architect Paul Balau. If you're into history, the Castello de San Pedro is the perfect site to see. It is a fortress on the coast of the Cuban city of Santiago de Cuba. It was a Spanish-American military architecture built in the 1700s. Traditions in Cuba. They have an immense love for their animal dominance. La Casa de Mofongo is one of many different Hispanic businesses located in New York. The one being presented today is by me, Emily Nunez. Some key points about this restaurant is that it's a Dominican restaurant. However, it sells other Hispanic foods. You can eat indoor and outdoor. They sell adult drinks and kid drinks. And the price and service is very good. A highly recommended dish in this restaurant is pork chop mofongo. It costs nineteen forty five. It serves one person. However, there are other dishes where you can serve up to two people. And of course, the kids can get chicken tenders and fries if they're picky eaters. This specific restaurant is located on 207th Street. It takes about an hour to get there both by bus and by car. It's preferred that you go by car since there is a parking garage right next to it. It costs about 10 to $15 for one or two hours. Across the street is Knoll's Pizzeria. Next door is Taco Bell. So if you ever have trouble looking for the restaurant, you can always look for these neighboring businesses. I recommend that you go here, one, because you can spend time with your family, two, the service is good and the servers also speak Spanish in case family members who speak Spanish want to order in Spanish. And three, you can enjoy the scenery while eating outside as well. I personally recommend this restaurant since I was able to have quality time with my family and was able to have good food while doing so. You can order online or you can request for delivery. Either way, it's worth buying the delicious food there and worth spending time there with your family. This concludes my presentation for today. Again, I am Emily Nunez and thank you for watching. Hispanic businesses in New York. Today I will be speaking about La Estrellita Poblana, which is a restaurant in the Bronx. Here's a picture of one of the restaurants in the Bronx.
locations. These are four locations of the restaurant La Estrellita Poblana. There are a couple more restaurants, but these are the first that were made. And these are all of the addresses. Reasons why I recommend this restaurant. The main reason I recommend this restaurant is because of the service. They have really good service. I usually order food to go but I have gone inside of one of the restaurants and the decoration is beautiful and the service is really good. Another reason why I really like this restaurant is because of the food. Obviously the food is what I like the most. Their food is mostly Mexican dishes and their restaurant is also very based on Mexican culture. Another reason I would recommend this restaurant is because of the locations. There are many different locations, so it really just depends where you are and where you are to all the different locations. It can be easy for you to find one that is near you. What I love the most about this restaurant is the nachos. The nachos specifically made with chicken. and. This plate is about like $12, depending on what size you get them, and I would really recommend them because they are really delicious. Lastly, this is the menu. Here you can see all of the different foods and the prices. Let's say if you were to go and stay in the restaurant, you would see the appetizers and all of the different prices. And here you can also see at the bottom of the menu, their number and one of the addresses and their website if you want to go check that out and they also have free delivery and that's the end of my presentation i hope you enjoyed